All right, everyone. A very good afternoon to all of you present here. I'd like to start my presentation with an analogy. So imagine you have a three-year-old toddler, all right? You want your toddler to go out and play, but you're afraid that if you send him to the playground, he'll get pushed around and bullied. You want a safe, secure playing area for your toddler. What do you do? Well, you build a small sandpit for him in your backyard. A small sandpit where he can play safely. You have your peace of mind because you know that nobody else plays there. It's his private sandpit. He's not going to get disturbed. He can play there comfortably. Sounds good? But then a problem starts to develop. All right, so your toddler is now it's three years, four years, five years. He's six years old and he's still playing in that very sandpit using the same sand, the same tools every day. You want him to go, go out and experience the real world. You want him to go to the playground where he can use slides, swings, seesaws, talk to other children. How long are you going to keep him confined to this small sandpit? Well, my friends, this is exactly the problem that, that faces distributed apps today. They're trapped in their own existence, in their own virtual machines. They can use the data within the blockchain, but they can't access external data. While this is all right in the beginning, when smart contracts were still young, now that they've grown up, now that they're becoming more advanced, it's become necessary for them to access external data. So before we go ahead, before we go to the technical stuff, let's step back for a moment. Bitcoin was launched in 2009, nine years ago. It was and is, still is the most valuable cryptocurrency by both price and market cap. Ethereum, on the other hand, was just launched around three years ago in 2015. And yet today, it has a market cap of over $40 billion. My question really is that what, what about Ethereum is so special that in three years, it's gone from nothing to a coin with a $40 billion market cap? What's special about Ethereum that separates it from Bitcoin? Why are there talks today of the flipping when Ethereum's market cap will rise above Bitcoin? What makes Ethereum special? The answer, as many of you may know it, is smart contracts. Smart contracts that can operate on a trustless manner on the blockchain. Now, the word smart contract itself is just industry jargon for any program that runs on a blockchain. All right? So you can have smart contracts for a variety of purposes. They're very versatile. Like you can have a smart contract to release certain funds at a predetermined period. Or let's say you're trading with someone on the internet and you want an escrow service to protect your funds. You can build a smart contract for that. Just like any other programming language, you can have smart contracts for nearly anything, anything that you desire. Now, there's a fundamental conflict between smart contracts and traditional programs. So typically, a program or a software is a very centralized piece of code, something that runs on a server or on a couple of servers. On the other hand, we have blockchain, which is a distributed ledger, a ledger that has no fixed place, resides on thousands of nodes. So how do we take the centralized concept of a program and apply it to something as decentralized as a blockchain? How do we do that? How is it that Ethereum is able to run smart contracts? The answer to that question lies in the Ethereum virtual machine. In Ethereum's case, it's known as the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. But nearly any blockchain platform that allows four programs to run on top of it uses some sort of a virtual machine. Now, I'll go into what virtual machines are a bit later, but the whole principle of the EVM is that it provides a code execution platform that allows a program to be run on several nodes, and it allows for consensus. Now, this may seem very technical, but over in, the next, in, the, in the forthcoming slides, I'll be simplifying these concepts further. First of all, what is a virtual machine? For those of you who aren't familiar with the concept, a virtual machine is essentially a computer inside another computer. All right? So to visualize what a virtual machine is, I want you to think of a room, all right? The room has thousands of safes in it, thousands of vaults. 
in this case the room itself represents your physical computer your physical machine like a computer or a laptop or a mobile phone something that has hardware to it something you can touch and feel the vault itself represents a confined space so it's completely separate from other vaults from the room anything that you keep inside that vault is invisible to somebody inside the room because they can't see through the vault it's invisible to something inside another of those vaults so each of these vaults is essentially another machine running inside your physical machine now just like you can stack up many vaults in one room you can have several virtual machines running in parallel on one computer and the primary advantage of virtual machines is that apart from running several of them on one physical device they're quite secure so in case you have some sort of malware or some sort of virus infecting your physical computer it's very hard for that virus to get into your virtual machine and the converse applies too so if you have a virus or if you have a malware inside your virtual machine it's very hard for it to escape the bounds of your virtual machine and actually infect your physical computer so in summary a virtual machine is like a prison it blocks something it doesn't allow any information to move from inside to outside the prison it's a secure holding area so what 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 relation does the EVM the ethereum virtual machine have with the network well all of you must be aware of the fact that a blockchain network such as ethereum is composed of nodes basically each node holds a copy of the of the blockchain and each of these nodes also has a copy of the EVM so each node has the ethereum virtual machine running and since a smart contract is essentially a program it's a program that runs inside the EVM whenever you publish a smart contract to the blockchain and whenever that contract is run the contract runs simultaneously across the EVMs on each of the nodes so ethereum today has 25,000 nodes and um, whenever you, you execute a smart contract the code runs on each of those 25,000 nodes. Now you may ask, what is the necessity of running the same thing over and over again on 25,000 machines? Why can't we just have one machine running it, putting the result up on the blockchain? Wouldn't that be better? Well, it may seem like it's better, but looking at the way the blockchain works, a system like that wouldn't work. Let's take an example of a simple smart contract, a simple program, that takes two inputs and adds them up all right it takes two inputs adds them up stores the result on the blockchain now let's say the inputs to this uh, smart contract were four and five so all of us know that four plus five equals nine let's assume that we had such a setup where this contract was only run on a couple of machines let's say two machines now this makes it very insecure because imagine i own those machines and i somehow fiddle with the way the evm works or the way my machine executes code and instead of giving out the output as 9 4 plus 5 equals 9 I output 4 plus 5 equals 7 let's say both of these computers do that and the value 7 is written to the blockchain permanently stored forever that would be wrong and since blockchain allows for zero trust it requires all the nodes to compute the answer of 4 plus 5 so each node comes up with the answer 9 they agree with each other all right the answer is indeed nine and they put that answer up on the blockchain so what you have at the end of the day is a program executed in a manner such that no one entity can fiddle with the code or fiddle with the way the code is operated and come up with an incorrect answer an erroneous value now the an the example that i gave you of four plus five is very basic it's very simple and the implications of an incorrect value out there isn't really too much i mean even if the answer is seven it doesn't really make a difference but if it's a more important app if it's something that's dealing with money at that point having an incorrect or erroneous value put up on the blockchain could lead to a loss of funds could be very dangerous now the EVM itself is great and it's great for three main reasons the first reason is it offers a code execution platform so any smart contract that's written runs on the EVM it runs consistently across all EVMs it's great so 
any any code that's written in solidity which is the language used to provide uh, to, used to program smart contracts that code will run on any evm whether it's on my computer whether it's on your computer it'll run the same way second of all it's secure and i've used the word sandbox here because it kind of links up to our notion of the sandpit so just like the child was protected inside the sandpit any code that runs inside the evm is protected because it's running inside a virtual machine third it allows for consensus which is exactly what i was talking about right now where after each of the nodes have computed an answer they can cross verify to see whether that answer is indeed correct and the reason why it works is because the evm whether it's run on my computer or whether it's run on your computer if given a smart contract and if given the same inputs will always produce the same output sounds good sure in fact the evm is probably a great platform it's amazing it's very well written but it has some limitations the security the speed the the reliability of the evm comes at a cost a very significant trade off has to be made to run something like the evm to run smart contracts on the evm smart contracts are trapped within the evm they are trapped within their virtual machine in the same way that the child was trapped inside that small sandpit this means that if you have any data inside your ethereum blockchain let's say information about the last 20 transactions or the transaction committed by a particular address sure the smart contract can make use of that data similar to the way the child can make use of any sand that's within the sandpit but as soon as you have any information any sort of data that isn't stored on the blockchain for example it's maybe on your own web server that kind of hosts data regarding your customers or data regarding the weather data regarding stocks whatever it is data that's not on the ethereum blockchain itself smart contracts can't access that because smart contracts cannot access external data sources now this isn't some random rule that somebody came up with to prevent smart contracts from accessing external data sources it's in fact fundamental to the way the blockchain works coming back to our example of nodes running a smart contract if both of us were running that program that adds two numbers and at any given time we had the inputs 4 and 5 both of us would come up with the answer 9 there would be consensus the transaction would be committed but think about it this way now if smart contracts could indeed access external data sources data like stocks imagine if today my node for example calculates the price of ether to uh, usd as 450 dollars at this point and a split second later when your node tries to compute the same answer it gets the value 450.55 or 451 or 452 or something like that a different value in this case the answer that i would come up with after my calculations could be vastly different than the answer you would come up with with your calculations and when the nodes try to compare these answers to find out whether the answer is calculated correctly the check would fail because let's say the smart contract found out the price of 0.1 ether i would get the answer 45 dollars you would get the answer as 45.2 dollars or 45.1 dollars there wouldn't be consensus the smart contract would fail to operate that's simply how the blockchain works while this is a significant limitation i think there are three main reasons why this is problematic first of all the way conventional programming works the way we access information that's not stored with us is using api calls application programming interfaces smart contracts natively can't run apis so if you have a ready made api available for let's say a stock market you can't implement that directly into a smart contract because that's simply not how it works it doesn't support external api calls second real time updates so imagine if in an application like stocks you need your information to be updated to the second or updated to the minute something of that sort it's again not possible with smart contracts because smart contracts are essentially differentiated from the external world they're separate 
They have their own sphere of existence. And anything that's outside that is very hard to access. Third, integration. If you're looking to put smart contracts into the way you work currently, into the way your programs work currently, it's very likely that you'll need to make some sort of API calls, you'll need to access some sort of external data. But since we've already discussed that this is a limitation of smart contracts, it really narrows down where you can use smart contracts in your business or in your platform. Sounds like a very serious limitation, something that could possibly change the way we use smart contracts. But the people at Ethereum and the people working in the blockchain space are pretty smart. And we do have a solution, a hack or a workaround to add external data to, to smart contracts. The solution manifests in the form of oracles, blockchain oracles. Let's try to understand what oracles are. So oracles are programs and they're programs that act like assistants. Think about your personal assistant, your personal secretary. When you go for a flight, when you have a meeting to attend, when you have some information to get, your assistant forwards that information to you. Maybe you have a meeting due tomorrow. Your assistant makes sure that you get the information on time, forwards that email to you, that's important. In a similar fashion, oracles act as assistants. But instead of acting as assistants for humans, they act as assistants for smart contracts. So they're essentially the link between external data sources and smart contracts. They're the bridge in the middle, which is why the pictogram shows it as a web service that connects to the Oracle, which in turn connects to smart contracts. So Oracles in operation are pretty simple. And if you think about it, it's almost obvious. Let's, let's see the five steps in which Oracles work. The first step is always a request. So you can have an oracle to, to you know, relay information to a smart contract for a, for a predetermined period, so maybe every five minutes. Or you could have a smart contract that works when you ask it to relay information. So the first step is always requesting the smart contract to push uh, requesting the oracle to push information to the smart contract. The second step is the fetch step. All right, so now the oracle knows that it needs to update the smart contract with some real world information. What it now does is it works in the old fashioned way. It uses an API call, gets the information of the web. All right. So maybe it has the API program for coin market cap and it gets the current price of Ethereum to USD. It fetches that price. The response will typically be in a JSON format and the Oracle can be programmed to filter out the unnecessary data and just come up with that integer value of 450. All right. Now the third step is signing a transaction. Now remember that the way oracles work is they aren't programs that are on the, on the blockchain itself. They're centralized programs running off chain. Once they've received the data and when they want to push this data to smart contracts, what they do is they sign a transaction to that smart contract containing the value to be sent. So a smart contract may have many variables in it. The oracle simply transfers that real world information to one of those variables by means of a transaction on the blockchain. Fourth, the smart contract receives the value. So the smart contract accesses its eth price variable, just another variable. It sees, all right, there's some information stored there. And the fifth step is it continues to process the data as if it were already on the blockchain. So in these five steps, what we've basically done is we've put something that wasn't on the blockchain onto the blockchain so that the smart contract can use it. The reason why this solution is nifty is because we aren't changing the way smart contracts work or we aren't changing the way the blockchain works. This is supported. You can just make an oracle right now. In fact, I'm going to be demonstrating an oracle in practice. It doesn't require some crazy proposals, some fantastic turnarounds. It's, it's a very clear, simple hack. It's not even a hack. It's, it's just making use of something that you already have to overcome a limit limitation of a particular technology. So there are many use cases of oracles. Now that we've established that oracles can add external data sources, you can use them for a lot of things. You can expand the use cases of smart contracts with oracles. But there are three main use cases that I'm particularly excited with and I'd like to share with you. First of all, we can have smart contract trading. So imagine you know, I, I can program a smart contract 
to trade on my behalf, to use real world values of Ethereum's price or a particular token's price, I can program it that when Ether's price hits $500 plus, automatically sell it off for some other ERC20 token, something like that. Imagine automated trading. Number two, we could have condition-based events. So this is a more broader, broader thing, and in fact, everything comes under this, but some real-world condition, when met, triggers a response, which in turn is carried out by the smart contract. An example of this would be, in fact, the third thing that I have here, real-life automation, where you can connect <coughs> IoT, where you can connect machine learning and blockchain, and all these new technologies can work together. Think about it this way, you order pizza, the pizza boy pulls up at your door, you have a camera that detects the pizza boy's presence, detects your order, automatically an oracle sends a request to a smart contract which releases the funds, all you do is pick up your pizza and you're good to go. Or think about in the case of police, let's say we could automate the way we take fines from uh, let's say over speeding or skipping red lights. The way we have cameras today that detect a number plate, maybe we could have some sort of deposit that each driver makes in the, in the initial stage. And every time he crosses a red light or he commits some offense, the smart contract automatically deducts a certain amount of a value, a certain value of ether or a certain value of some other currency from uh, the user's balance. So essentially, we've combined some of the latest technologies that exist today with blockchain so that they aren't restricted to just data that, that, involve, that involves transactions on the blockchain, but any real world data. While this may sound all well and good, I must admit there are some faults with oracles. And in fact, there are three main reasons why oracles haven't been adopted wide, widely as yet. The first reason why is that although smart contracts are, are safe, oracles needn't be. So, like I mentioned, you can have 25,000 nodes computing the result of a smart contract, but you aren't having 25,000 nodes computing the value sent by an oracle. An oracle operates on one server or on a couple of servers. So if somebody manages to change the source code there and send some sort of a wrong value to the smart contract, the smart contract will accept it. It doesn't have any inbuilt safe checks or something of that sort. So imagine a trading, a trading platform that uses oracles and all of a sudden we have some guy hack into their oracle and instead of sending the price of Ether to USD as $450, it sends the price as let's say $1 and the smart contract is programmed in such a way that if the price fall, falls below a certain value, it automatically sells off the Ether. So suddenly you've sold all your Ethereum reserves at the exchange rate of $1 per Ether. Certainly possible. Second, it's expensive. Now, every time you transfer data to a smart contract using an Oracle, you're putting up a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain. So that means that, let's say you're updating information every five minutes, Every five minutes, your oracle is signing a transaction on the blockchain. And transactions cost money. So let's say each transaction costs 10 cents. In one hour, you're sending 12 requests. You've already spent $1.2 or nothing. You're just sending data. So again, it is expensive. Third, everything that you put up through oracles on smart contracts becomes public information. So if I'm transferring the exchange rates, Anyone can view my smart contract address, see the last 10 values that were put onto the Oracle. So they have, anyone can introspect, can anyone can interrogate the blockchain and find out which values I've transferred. So if you plan to put something like sensitive information on a public blockchain, Oracles isn't really the right way to go. Nevertheless, if you're good at coding, if you put thought into your programming, you can certainly overcome some of these limitations. Let's take the example that I've been looking at for so long of trading bots. I said that they were expensive. Even if you had to update information every five minutes, we would need to send 12 transactions an hour. Let me show you a way we can reduce that to one transaction over the entire lifespan of the contract. Here, in the first case, if I were a naive programmer, what I would do is I would program the smart contract to take the value from the Oracle, compare it to some fixed price, let's say $500.
If the value is above $500, I would execute some action. Instead, I can just shift the logic layer to the Oracle itself. So the Oracle now compares the price, current price of Ethereum real time. If the price is below $500, the smart contract isn't doing anything anyway, so it doesn't bother to send the transaction. As soon as it rises above $500, it sends that transaction, the smart contract detects, okay, the price is above $500, and it does whatever it has to do. So in this case, we only needed to send one transaction to complete an automated trade. Similarly, the concept of oracles being centralized, though it may seem like it defeats the purpose of the blockchain, we've got to realize that most of our programs today, if not all of them, are essentially centralized. And we find, found ways to protect them from being altered or modified in any way. So if we put enough safeguards on oracles themselves, and we program certain you know, checks within smart contracts that are smart enough to detect when data is being artificially manipulated. Like for example, if it detects that the price has gone from 500 to zero or to one in a span of maybe just a minute, it knows that something is wrong. And immediately, maybe we could have some sort of an alert, we can have some sort of a lock, some mechanism to track such a threat. All right, so now before I end, I'd like to show you a real life Oracle in work. So let's see, I've gone in theory, now let's see a real life oracle in work. And this is a very simple oracle. All it does is it fetches the current market cap of the whole crypto market and pushes it to a smart contract. All right. Okay. So on this uh, on my virtual machine out here, on, on an Ubuntu virtual machine, I've deployed a test chain, an RPC test chain, my own private version of a blockchain, and I'm running an Oracle on it, all right? So let's see. Let me run a program. Before I go ahead and do that, let me explain what this whole system is comprised of. We have three major programs running here. We have one Solidity program, a Solidity code, that's our smart contract. It's a very simple smart contract. All it does is it stores the value of the current market cap of the crypto market in a variable when an oracle feeds it that data. And we have a get function that allows us to fetch that value from the contract. That's program number one. The second program that we have is a JavaScript program. It's called Oracle CMC. And what this program does is it's the actual oracle. It's the assistant that transfers the market cap from an external data source, coin market cap, to uh, the smart contract. And third, we have a client.js, which is again a JavaScript file. And what this does is it prompts the Oracle to actually go ahead and transfer that information. All right, so let's see. The Oracle is running in background. The terminal window out here shows my test chain, the activity on my test chain. And this is a free terminal window I have out here. All right. So we can see the market cap of Bitcoin out here. I'll run this again so you can see it clearer. So we can see that the market cap of the crypto market is somewhere around $250 billion. I don't know if you can see that, but it's written out here. All right. Now let's see our latest block on the blockchain. A transaction has been sent. It's been sent from my Oracle to the smart contract. Now let's ver verify the data that's been sent. So here, I have an hexadecimal input, which is basically an input that corresponds to the market cap of the, ma of the crypto market. What I'm going to do is copy that over. So it's a hexadecimal value. You can't interpret it. And I'm going to put it in a hexadecimal to decimal converter. There we go. So here we can see that the decimal number that's been sent is indeed $250 billion. This matches the one that my Oracle fetched and the one that or my Oracle sent to the smart contract. So what I've done out here is my, or my client program sent a request to the Oracle to transfer that information, that data, to the smart contract. Now if you want to go into what this program, this code is actually composed of, 
I can show you um, some of the technical details. So let's see. First, I'm going to be opening up my smart contract. So this is my smart contract out here. And it consists of, in a sense, two functions. A set BTC cap function and a get BTC cap function. The setter function allows me to set some value into a variable. And the get function allows me to retrieve a value from the variable. So it's a very simple smart contract. And this one's been deployed on my private chain. Now if you go and look at the Oracle program in itself, which is a JavaScript file, So this is a slightly longer program, but again, it's not hard to understand. A lot of it is just stuff that I needed to write to get it to work with my, with my private testnet. But essentially, the important part out here is this one. Here, I've put up a fetch request. So it fetches information from coin market APIs. That's what its function is. And it signs a transaction to the, to the smart contract on the blockchain. Again, if you can see, this program isn't especially long in comparison to what we've seen earlier today. It's a very simple program. And lastly, we have client.js, which in a, in a sense doesn't do much. All it does is it triggers the Oracle program, and the Oracle program does the heavy lifting. So what we saw out here was a very simple example of an Oracle at work, a very basic Oracle in play. But the fact that I was able to achieve something that most of us would think is not achievable, access real world data using a smart contract, just shows us that many of the limitations of blockchain today can be fixed with nifty little hacks, with nifty little programs. And the whole concept of having a distributed ledger doesn't mean that we need to restrict ourselves to certain data sets or to certain use cases. But by evolving programs that are able to plug in those loopholes, we can expand this technology beyond what, what it was intended to do, beyond just cryptocurrencies, into new markets, into new industries. And Oracles are just one example. There are several of these programs. I hope you enjoyed my, uh, my talk. And if there are any questions, I'd love to take them.